All right. So the lecture tonight is on emergence. In the last lecture, we examined a remarkable new development in biology in the field of genetics, a field which occupies the center of the stage in the neo-Darwinian theory of how evolution takes place. Previously, it had been taken for granted by most scientists that traits were transmitted from one generation to the next solely by means of the genes. This meant that novelty or improvement on which any evolution of new species must depend could occur only through mutation, an accidental alteration in the chemistry of the gene. But the vast majority of such accidental alterations are harmful rather than beneficial to the organism, a fact that does not add greatly to the credibility of the theory. The new development is the discovery that there is a pathway of inheritance which lies outside the genes and is therefore termed epigenetic. This takes place chiefly through the mechanism in each living cell by which the genes are activated or expressed through devices that affect gene expression, such as methylation, the attachment of a methyl group to the amino acid cytosine in the DNA, the organism can respond to its environment in ways that can be passed on to its offspring. The result is reminiscent of the inheritance of acquired characteristics earlier suggested by Lamarck, but emphatically rejected by most followers of Darwin. The net effect of epigenetics is that we can now see a way in which it seems practically possible for novelty and improvement to occur, as we would expect with living teleological beings. We turn now to another recent development in science, this time in physics, which also seems to have possible significance for the relationship between science and human values, and specifically for the view we've been advocating in these lectures, Plato's thesis that living things move themselves. That is, life, the phenomenon of life, is not mechanistic, but teleological. The, the development in physics that we're referring to is the theory of emergence. In earlier lectures, we saw that there are two main reasons why science is and must be mechanistic in its methodology. They are first the rational principle of parsimony in explanation, otherwise known as Occam's razor after the medieval monk and researcher William of Occam, which states that explanatory factors should not be multiplied without necessity or, all things else being equal, a simpler explanation is always to be preferred to a more complex one. As we saw, mechanistic explanations are always simpler than teleological ones. Secondly, only mechanistic explanation can be proven, 
since uh, only mechanistic explanations allow the kind of prediction and verification that's required for genu genuine proof of a theory. Teleological explanations don't have that kind of definiteness. It has followed from these reasons that the physical sciences are reductionist. Reductionism means explaining higher or more complex phenomena by means of lower or less complex ones and attributing therefore more reality to the lower level than the higher one. Reductionism explains the macro level of reality, the world of our ordinary experience, by means of the micro level, the world we find in our microscopes. For example, we explain the phenomenon of colour in a fabric by pointing to the behaviour of the electrons in the surface of the fabric when they encounter light. The behaviour of the electrons is real and can be demonstrated scientifically. By comparison, the reality of the colour is uh, subordinate and secondary, a function of the electron behaviour. It might almost be called an illusion caused by the electrons. The real world, as science reveals it to us then, is the micro world of atoms and atomic particles and the forces that act between them, rather than the world revealed to us by our ordinary experience. In recent years, however, there's been a big change in this. It has come to be realised that there are cases where this does not work, but rather the opposite, where it is the higher and more complex level that explains the lower and simpler one. Such, for example, is the case with Newton's laws of motion. The first of these laws is the law of inertia, that a body at rest will remain at rest and a body in motion will remain in motion unless it's acted on by an outside force. These laws cannot be explained by any simpler or lower level of reality, but they can be predicted by quantum mechanics, which is more complex as a limiting case. Later on, however, I'm going to raise some questions about this, and so I'm going to give you an alternative version of this, uh, not precisely this, but a, a better, from my viewpoint, a better example of uh, emergence is uh, the concept of gravity. Uh, Newman, uh, Newton's concept of gravity, which is stated in his law of gravitation, uh, is one thing, and Einstein's explanation of gravity in terms of the nature of space is different. Uh, Einstein's uh, theory of gravity makes it possible, well, explains uh, Newton's theory in broader terms. Uh, and uh, this raises the question of, of uh, what it means for something to be emergent. Uh, and I'm going to say later on that the crucial factor, I believe, is, is explanation rather than prediction. Uh, quantum mechanics makes it possible, in my understanding, to make predictions. But it does not seem to explain and uh, so uh, um, there are questions as to the, the, the role that quantum mechanics can play in this kind of an arrangement. We'll come, come back to that later. 
1972, the American physicist Philip Anderson, then working at Bell Labs, published in Science magazine a short paper with the title, More is Different. The argument of this paper was that although reductionism is almost universally accepted among working scientists, it is not in practice very useful. The reason he gives for this is that the ability to reduce anything to simple fundamental laws does not imply the ability to start from those laws and reconstruct the universe, as it were, in a positive sense. The behaviour of large and complex aggregates of elementary particles, it turns out, is not to be understood in terms of a simple extrapolation of the properties of a few particles. Instead, at each level of complexity, entirely new properties appear. At each stage, entirely new laws, concepts and generalizations are necessary, he says, requiring inspiration and creativity to just as great a degree as the previous ones. Although scientists assume that psychology can be reduced to biology, and biology to chemistry, and chemistry to physics, Anderson points out that psychology is not applied biology, nor is biology applied chemistry. Anderson shows why this is the case by discussing some particular molecules. The sugar molecule has 40 atoms, but there's a difference between sugar molecules produced in the bodies of living beings and those we synthesize by a chemical reaction. Those that we make by a chemical reaction are on average, he says, symmetrical in terms of the parity between left-handed and right-handed versions. But in those produced in living bodies, and only in them, the symmetry is broken. Arguing from the macro level to the micro is often in science called analysis. Arguing in the reverse direction from the micro to the macro is termed synthesis. Anderson remarks that the relationship between a system and its parts is intellectually a one-way street. Synthesis is expected to be all but impossible. Analysis, on the other hand, may be not only possible, but fruitful in all kinds of ways. He gives the example of superconductivity, which, however, is too technical to reproduce in this lecture. In conclusion, he remarks, we have yet to recover from the arrogance of some molecular biologists who seem determined to try to reduce everything about the human organism to only, quote unquote, chemistry. From the common cold and all mental disease to the religious instinct. Surely, he says, there are more levels of organization between human ethology and DNA than there are between DNA and quantum electrodynamics. And each level can require a whole new conceptual structure. End of quote. Anderson's paper has been one of the most discussed in the history of physics. It's usually considered to have given rise to the idea of emergence, 